thank you for joining us again today. To be honest, I look forward to this opportunity to share with you from God's Word, especially concerning prophetic things. Matter of fact, some people said, well, why do you continue to make programs? We started out, of course, first because uh, services were closed down, uh, but we were enjoying the fact that we're getting response from people teaching on areas that maybe they don't get in many of the local churches today. And so here's what I would say. Well, I always hope that, that you'll learn something, but I hope that it goes beyond just learning a fact, but I hope as well it, it softens your heart and my heart because I find that I need to be reminded of the things that we're studying, that the return of Christ is very near. And so today we want to start on what might be a two or three session lesson and I've entitled this, What's Next on God's Calendar? I think every one of us would like to know what's next on God's calendar. And so we're gonna to try to, to do a biblical approach to it. And I'm gonna be honest with you, one of the reasons I'm excited to be alive today is because I think that perhaps the next thing on God's timetable could be the rapture of the church. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means that there's gonna come a time based on the promise that Jesus made to his disciples and as well in the, in the epistles that Christ will come in the clouds, a shout will be given, and true believers will go to be with him in the clouds and then into heaven. It's a great hope that we have. Matter of fact, the book of Titus, chapter two, verse 13 says this, looking for that blessed hope, and sometimes I should say, even the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I look at this picture and, and what a scene that's gonna be when Christ comes in the clouds, the doors, and gates of heaven are open, and the saints on the earth are, are brought up to, to meet Jesus in the sky. I'll tell you what, that hope is what is needed today. And I'm so thankful that as Christians, we have that hope. But you know, we can go a step further because Ephesians chapter four, verses three through six, it talks about endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. What is interesting, first of all, notice that we don't make the unity. God makes the unity because he's the one that made us one body and one spirit. But it's, I think, very important to note that we have one hope. You see, unfortunately today, man has such big plans that we don't think we have one hope. The real truth is, at the time when Christ comes back for us, just like we're seeing today, I believe the church is gonna say, you know what, we have one hope, and that hope is Jesus Christ. The plans of men fail. The plans of men change but our one hope of Christ does not change. And so I'm so glad that we have the one hope. And according to Titus, that is the soon appearing of Jesus Christ. But we also today wanna to look at what I call this, the purpose of the events that are coming up and the promise of our hope. Because you see, this purpose and this promise, and then to know when these things occur, I think it's gonna give you great hope I think it will encourage not only what you know, but it will certainly encourage your heart as well. So we wanna look at those, the purpose and the promise and when these things occur. I've chosen five, five events that we'll be looking at. And each time we'll say, what's the purpose? And then we'll say, and when will this take place? And so we wanna look at the rapture. What's the purpose of the rapture? God has a divine purpose for it. And what's the purpose for the tribulation? God also has a divine purpose for the tribulation. We want to study the Battle of Armageddon, the Millennial Kingdom, and the Great White Throne Judgment. If we can find the purpose that God has for each of those, and when it occurs, I think it will really help your understanding of the events that we're living through right now and the events that God has planned in the near future for planet Earth. And so today, we want to concentrate on this. What is the purpose of the rapture? And as you look at our chart that we've used so many times, I put our five topics of interest as five little bullets across our, our chart. And today, what's the purpose of the rapture? Well, the purpose of the rapture, based on what the Bible says, is this. Christ is gonna take his bride, his bride is the church, or believers, home to heaven. And I want you to notice when it occurs. You see, right now we're in the church age. We don't know how much longer the church age will go, but based on scripture, based on all the events that are unfolding before us, I really think that we're at the end of the church age. The church age began on the day of Pentecost. According to Acts chapter two, believers were baptized into one body. And remember, we have one body, Ephesians four, we have one spirit and one hope. And so that was the beginning of the church age. Now, almost 2000 years later, we're looking at this and I think we're at toward the end of it. And so the purpose of the rapture, Christ has decided he's gonna take his bride home. 
He's going to take us to heaven. Remember, he told his disciples in John 14, I, if I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare that place, I'm going to come again for you. I think we're on the brink of that coming. And so we want to look at the purpose for the rapture, and then we want to look at the promises. Has God really promised this event of the rapture? I believe he has. And so look at the chart for the purpose and for the when, and now let's look at some of the reasons that God gives us for his promise. Well, one of those has to do with the fact that, that we know that there's going to be scoffers. God gave us promises. And I think it's because, we, in Peter, it says this, knowing this first, that in the last days, scoffers will come, walking after their own lust and, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? I'm sure if you're like myself, who believe that the Lord could come at any time, how many times have we heard people say, yeah, but people have been saying that for 2,000 years. That's okay. You want to know something? One of these days, we're going to be exactly right. I think Jesus would like for us to continue to look for and be excited about the fact that he is coming again. And then sometimes these scoffers, well, they'll say, well, don't you know the, the word rapture is not in the Bible? You know what? I get that at almost every conference I go to, and people think I've really stumped them now. Well, I agree. The word rapture itself is not there. But really, the word is to snatch out, to, to pull out, or maybe to pull with great power. And it is there. Sometimes it's translated to catch away. It's like the, the wolf that goes and he catches the, the sheep. He catches he snatches it from the flock. And so this word to catch out, repito is what it is described as a Latin word, but the English word for that is really the word rapture. And so while the word itself rapture is not in the Greek language, it is certainly there in its implication because we're told that he's gonna come and catch the bride out. He's gonna come and pull us up with great power. Listen, let me tell you, the idea of the rapture, the promise of the rapture is certainly there, and I'm so glad, aren't you? Because that's our blessed hope. And then here's another thing to answer the scoffers. Isn't it interesting that every writer of a New Testament epistle wrote concerning the coming of Christ? The Apostle Paul does it continually. Matter of fact, some books like Thessalonians, every chapter has something concerning the coming of Christ. It certainly is a promise of God. It's one that we can hold on to. And so what's the purpose? Well, it's to call the church home to be with heaven. And what's the promise? He promised it through every writer of the New Testament epistles. James says the coming of the Lord. Jude says in Enoch also and talks about the, the coming of Christ. John says, don't be ashamed before him at his coming. Behold, he comes with clouds. Listen, it's a doctrine of the Bible. Why are we afraid of that doctrine of the Bible? I think it's this, Satan would love for us not to be excited about it. Because if we could not be excited about it, then maybe we'll be discouraged even these last days. So the purpose of the rapture is to call the church out. And the when, it could be at any time. We're at the end of the church age, I believe. And we have events coming that the Bible says the church will not go through. Here's the second aspect of it. It's the second part of the promise. Christ removes us from or before the tribulation, and he doesn't take us through the tribulation. Now, we probably could use a whole lesson or two on this, but I want to just show you a few highlights because, you see, in the Bible, there's promises of God. He talks about how that the rapture is like a Jewish wedding. We'll look at that in a few minutes. He also gives promises to the seven churches and to the Feast of Jehovah and the 77s. You see, all these show the pattern of when God will deal with the church and when God will deal with Israel. I know today there's something called replacement theology. People have the idea that the church has replaced the Jews. Nothing can be further from scriptural truth. Israel will coexist with the church. We're doing it right now. And those that are believers, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, when Christ comes back and calls his bride home, they'll go to be with him in heaven. So we don't replace it. Matter of fact, we'll see how important it is because the doctrines of the Bible, the, the promises of God are clearly distinct for these two groups of people. But I know this that one of the important things that he removes us from the tribulation and not through the tribulation is important. Here's how come I can promise you that this is what God has in mind. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols. Notice how many times the word from is here, from idols, to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivers from the wrath to come. Now, four times the word from is there. 
And I think it's important for you to understand that there's really two different Greek words translated from. One is the word ektero, which means to save us out of. The other one is the word in, en. It means to save us through. In other words, each time it's used here, it is the ektero. He saved us out of the wrath to come. We don't go through it. Otherwise, he would have used this word, but he saves us out of it. Go back here, and it says, he saved us, we turned to God from idols. Now, did we serve idols? And as we continue to serve idols, that's how God revealed himself? Absolutely not. He takes you out of the worship of idols. He, he saves you from, not going through it, but he saves you out of it. That idea is so important, because as we continue to look, look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from, out of, the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. What a promise of God. Aren't you glad for that promise? That's why it's called the blessed hope. Listen, let me tell you, what we're watching today is horrible. I've never seen the world in such chaos, confusion. I think the hope for the world is, is diminishing day by day. But let me tell you this, the hope of the believer is great. Why? We have a blessed hope that Christ will come for us. And we know this, that before the tribulation ever comes, Christ will come and call the church out. The purpose of the rapture is to pull his bride to heaven. When? Before the tribulation ever begins. Now, let's look at a third aspect of this. You see, some of the promises of God are related to something called Daniel's 70 weeks. And it shows how the tribulation is designed for Israel and not for the church. This is such an important study. And matter of fact, we're gonna, we're gonna embark on it next week. And, and we've done some of this, but, but in more detail next week. But I wanna give you just a, a couple highlights because you see, when you look at this study, it's interesting because in the book of Daniel, he says how that this is gonna be for Daniel's people, those would be the Jewish people. And it talks about Jerusalem, which is a, a Jewish city. And when he gives all of these promises, what is interesting is that he's taken it and he's divided the 77s that he promised that he would give to Israel. And he divides them into three distinct regions. Look at Daniel chapter nine if you want to on your own. And you'll find he says, there's gonna be seven sevens. That would be 49 years. That's a commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. Fulfilled exactly as God promised it. And then he said, there's gonna be 62 sevens that's 434 more years, to the completion of the temple until Messiah enters Jerusalem. And next week, we're gonna again see the promise right to the day, I mean to the very day. It's accurate in one day out of 173,880 days. That's how accurate God is. And then we have this gap of the church age. We have the crucifixion of Christ. We have the rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. And so Israel is set aside. But remember, God promised him 70 sevens, so, so you take seven sevens and 62 sevens, he's fulfilled 69 of the sevens. But if God promised him 70 sevens, believe me, he's gonna give them all 490 years. He's gonna give them all 70 sevens. And so there's one more period of seven. It's referred to in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse seven, as the time of Jacob's trouble. Not the church's trouble, but Jacob's trouble. And next week, I'll tell you the, the express purpose of God for the tribulation and when and how it occurs. But for now, what a, what a joy for us to know that this church age gap is what we're living in now. And at the end of it is when Christ will come back and he will pull out, he'll snatch out, he'll rapture true believers to be with him in heaven. My friend, are you a true believer? There's a lot of people who say, Lord, Lord, and, and, and they don't really know Christ. That they know his name, maybe. Maybe they know a few stories about him, but they've never met him personally. I hope before the program is done today, you'll decide to know him personally, to receive him as your personal savior. And so as we look at this, God promises Israel one more period of seven, and he's gonna fulfill it. But for the church, we're not told that we'll have the 77s. We will be raptured at the end of that, of that church age that we're embarked on right now. Here's the fourth uh, reason. The plan and the pattern of God shows that the order of the rapture before the tribulation begins is clear in Revelation chapter 4, 5, and 6. I hope you have just a, a moment to really think about this because one of the most 
precious passages for any believer is Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Listen as I read it. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I believe that Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, indeed is an indicator of the rapture when it occurs and what will be accomplished. What a thrill. Here's why I say it's quite a thrill. Notice this. The position, the timing of Revelation chapter 4 is very important. If we looked at Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, and maybe if you have your Bible and you're, you're reading along with me today, well, you'll enjoy this because it says, Write the things which thou hast seen. You see, the first division of this is the fact that things which thou hast seen, past tense, that was chapter 1. The glory of God, the person of Christ, had been introduced in the Gospels. Next, write the things which are. In other words, they are here presently. That's present tense. Chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation deals with the church age. And then it says this, the third division, and things which shall be hereafter, in other words, future. And those are events in chapter 4 through 22. So as we look at this, please keep in mind, these are things which will be hereafter. And the very first thing that happens after the church age is John says, I was called into heaven. He said, come up here. Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, that when Christ comes to the clouds, there'll be a shout. There'll be a sound of a trumpet, the invitation to come up here and we'll be with Jesus. Do you see the parallel? It's wonderful. And so I think the promise of God indicates his purpose in bringing the church out before the tribulation ever begins. Now, this is important in Revelation as well, because you see, really, the tribulation can't start until the Antichrist is revealed, and that's not until Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Look at it. It says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder of one of the four living creatures, saying, Come. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer, the revealing of the Antichrist. But he can't come until the seal is broken. The first seal reveals the Antichrist. And what's interesting, you see, crowns aren't laid at the feet of God until chapter 4, verse 10. And we can't get our crowns until we've been raptured and taken to heaven. And he can't open the scroll until chapter 6 after he's already received the crowns. You, you see the importance of this order. Here's another one. Hereafter, the word metatauta, there's three divisions in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. And he says, things which will be metatauta hereafter. And when you come to chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 1, he says, metatauta, I looked and behold. He tells us clearly, thirdly, here's this third category. And so the divisions of Revelation speak to the fact the church has got to be gone. Now, now this is so important. Let's play it backwards so you get it. When we are raptured, what happens? We sing praises to God. And when we do, we're given crowns. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 says that we take our crowns, we lay them at the feet of God the Father. And all heaven sings worship to God the Father. Chapter 5 God the Father sits there with a scroll, seal with seven seals. No one was found worthy to open it until they saw Jesus, who was described as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. The next verse says, he stood as a lamb that had been crucified or slain, and he was the one worthy. And so he now takes that scroll with the seven seals. And when he does, all heaven sings worship to him. Chapter five ends with heaven singing worship to the Lamb and the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders, that's us, that's the church, we fall down to worship Him. And only after that time, now the Lamb opens the first seal and when He does, the Antichrist is revealed. The Antichrist revealing, making a treaty with Israel, that begins the tribulation. Let's play it backwards. He can't begin the tribulation until the Antichrist is revealed. The Antichrist is not revealed until we worship Christ in heaven. We don't worship Christ in heaven until he receives the scroll with seven seals, and the first one releases the Antichrist. And we don't even begin to worship the Lamb until, first of all, we've worshiped the Father and laid our crowns at his feet, and we don't get our crowns until we're raptured. 
and we're not raptured until chapter 4, verse 1. It's impossible for the church to go through any second of the tribulation. What a promise by God. Aren't you glad you see the time frame of this? Well, here's the fifth reason. The rapture is pictured by a bride. You see, the church is, is the bride of Christ, and we're going to be married to Jesus. And it's interesting because, you see, while Israel and, and the church are distinct and separate, sometimes there's pictures that we find of one and another that, that really help us to understand Scripture. And such it is with the, the bride, a Jewish bride. Let me just give you a few highlights of a, of a Jewish bride. For example, let's say a young man wants to get married. Well, first of all, he'd look around in his own hometown. Maybe he saw a suitable bride, maybe not. But if he didn't, he would leave his hometown he might go to an, another town or a village, and finally he would find his bride. And when he found her, he would go to the father of the bride, and he would make a covenant, a, a, I'm gonna say a contract with him. And what he would do is he would say, here's what I'll give you for your daughter as a, as a bride. I'll, I'll pay for her, I'll buy her from you. And they would seal that by drinking a cup of wine. And then, the girl would go back to her father's house and she would prepare herself because it was her obligation to be ready when the, the groom went back to his father's house and he would begin to build a house for his new bride. He would build it right alongside his own father's house. And when he had the house done for his bride, now he would leave, he would go back to her village, usually at night, and he would give a shout, ready. And without warning, when she heard the ready, she would come immediately. She wouldn't say, hey, give me another week or give me another month. No, her job while she was waiting for him to get the house ready was to be ready for him. And he would just give a shout and they would be gone. And then they would leave. They would go back to his father's house. And for the next seven days, there would be a wedding ceremony in which the bride and the groom would be hidden away in the father's house. At the end of those seven days, now, he would come out, both the bride and the bridegroom would come out and reveal themselves, introduce themselves to, to the public and to the, the people that are waiting. Do you see the pattern? Christ is going to come. He's going to shout, ready. And we're going to be pulled off of this earth. We're going to go to the Father's house. At the end of seven years, the Bible says, we'll come back from heaven down to the earth at the Battle of Armageddon and watch Jesus defeat the nations there. We'll watch him. Uh, set up the, the millennial kingdom. It's exactly what God had in mind when he spoke of us as being his bride. But to me, it is so interesting that Jesus came. He looked around heaven. I'm sure the angels thought, wow, maybe he'll choose one of us. But it said, no, he came to earth. He paid the price. The price for us was not in silver and gold, but he paid our price, our diary, in his own blood. I'm so thankful for Jesus that he chose us as a bride. And this picture is expressed throughout the Bible. Matter of fact, this, the character of Joseph, what a picture of Jesus he has. Someone has said there's over 100 parallels between Jesus and Joseph. I'm not saying that Joseph was sinless, but there's no sin recorded of him in the Bible. So he's a great picture of Jesus in so many ways, loved by his father, hated by his brothers. But one of the, the most unique ways is found in Genesis chapter 41, 45. There it says that, that Joseph, knowing that this famine was coming, a seven-year famine that was uh, pictured in a dream by Pharaoh, before the seven years of famine ever occurred, Joseph picked and married a Gentile bride. Wow, what a wonderful picture of Jesus Christ because you see, he's gonna take his Gentile bride. That's the church. That, that's those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. He's going to take us before the seven years of famine, the seven years of tribulation ever begin. And then I want to mention just one more reason. It's interesting because you see, the wording of the book of Revelation is very clear. Do you know that the word church is used 25 times in the book of Revelation? And what's interesting is that 19 of those times is prior to chapter 4. And then from chapter 4, there's no mentions of the church all the way until we get through chapter 16. But the other remaining uh, mentions six more times after chapter 19. So here's my point. I think the church is raptured in chapter four, verse one. 
I think the church does not come back to the earth until after Christ comes back at the end of the, the tribulation in the battle of Armageddon. And it's parallel in Revelation, mentioned 19 times in the first four chapters, not mentioned again until Christ comes back to the battle of Armageddon. Where's the church? Well, you see the events described in chapters six through uh, 18 are events of the tribulation. And the church is not on the earth in the tribulation. Why? They've been raptured, they've been taken home to heaven. Wow, isn't God wonderful in the plan that he has? And so now we go back. What was the purpose of the rapture? It was to take the bride of Christ, it was to take believers out before this time of trouble called the tribulation that God put there, designed particularly for Israel. God has a purpose, we'll look at it next week, Lord willing. And so it's wonderful to know that when Christ takes his bride home to heaven, we will escape this tribulation. You wanna know why? Because that's the wrath of God. And on the cross, Jesus bore the wrath of God for every one of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. Would you accept him today? Well, now for some of your questions, you know, one of my highlights each week is to see some of the questions that come in from, from people that view the live streams. And, and so I decided that we'll try to do a few of your questions. Maybe we can do three of them very quickly today. And one of those questions that I get all the time is, are we already in the tribulation? And the answer is no, we're not. Because you see, the tribulation begins with the signing of a treaty with Israel and Israel will set down all their weapons and they'll become unwalled villages. That's not the position of Israel today. It, we also know this, that in this tribulation period of time, uh, the, the Bible speaks of how the wrath of God will be poured out. The wrath of God has already been poured out on Calvary, on Jesus to pay the debt of our sin. And so, no, we're not in the tribulation. We will know when we're in the tribulation because the Antichrist will clearly make a treaty and all the world will come and they'll accept that treaty as the conditions of peace. Right now, we're searching for peace. And so I think before the tribulation, we're gonna be raptured. Here's the second question. Can Christians take the mark of the beast? Mm, there's a lot of questions about this today. Well, the Bible says that in the middle of the tribulation, this would be Revelation chapter 11, that says the 42 month period, 12 and 13, that's where this mark of the beast comes in chapter 13. Notice that it's halfway through the seven year period. And so if the church is gone here before the tribulation ever begins, it's impossible for us to take the mark of the beast. So any mark, whether it's an electronic device or a, a tattoo or a, a, a vaccine, it can't truly be the mark of the beast. But there will come a time when the Antichrist will say, if you're gonna buy, you're gonna sell, if you're gonna trade, if you're gonna go to school, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a part of the, my kingdom, then you've got to endorse me, and how you endorse me is you take the mark of the beast. Whatever that mark is, wh whether it's electronic or, or injected or a, a, a tattoo on your right hand or on your forehead, the, the Bible doesn't say that, but I know this, right now people are being conditioned to take a mark. I, I, I think there's lots of ways that people are trying to figure out how to track us and how to mark us. And, and even the idea that they can control us and tell us we gotta wear a mask and we gotta take this mask or mark, it's coming. Thank God, the blessed hope says the church is gone before all this comes to its final effect. Listen, if you're worried about the mark of the beast, get saved and you'll miss it because that's in the middle of the tribulation and we're gone before the tribulation ever begins. See why I say it's so important to know the purpose of the rapture and when the rapture occurs? Here's another question. Is the Antichrist alive today? Well, I've already mentioned to you that in Revelation chapter six, verse one, he comes out to conquer the world. And I believe that we could be raptured chapter four at any time. And so yes, I believe the Antichrist is alive today. The Bible doesn't reveal who he is. Matter of fact, he's not revealed, Second Thessalonians chapter two, until after the church is gone. But after the church is gone in the rapture, I think one of the first things that will happen is the Antichrist will step forward saying, I have a plan for peace. And here's my plan. Be a part of my kingdom. And if you really wanna be a part of my kingdom, then, then you vote for me. And you vote for me by taking my mark, my, my, my tattoo, whatever it is in your right hand or in your forehead. You see, the Antichrist, if he's gonna do this and the, the tribulation could begin at any time, then I think he's alive today. Daniel says that he's a little toe. He's not an important person right now, but he'll become very big once he reveals himself after the church is gone. So yes, I think the Antichrist is alive today, but I'm not saying this is 
person is the Antichrist. There's a lot of people that have the spirit of Antichrist. And there's a lot of people leading the way to Antichrist. And I caution you to, to f be careful who you follow because they could, they could be leading you in that direction. But the Antichrist cannot begin his devilish power. Why? Because the Spirit of God is greater than the Antichrist and the Spirit of God is present today and he's with those of us who are believers and he'll go with us when we're raptured, snatched out of here by Jesus. Now, those are some of your questions, but let me ask you a question. Are you ready for my question? And here's my question, are you ready? You see, we've been looking at these events and through our almost year together live streaming, we've looked at a lot of current events. We've looked at a lot of things concerning Israel and the nations. And here's what I'm convinced of. I think we're on the brink of Jesus coming. And so my question is this, are you ready? Remember, I began today by saying, I hope it's something that you'll learn. It's always good for us to, to learn the, the plan of God and the program of God and to have our minds exercised and to get facts, facts that are true or important. But if we stop with just the facts, then we haven't accomplished what we really want to accomplish. And so, again, I want you to say, see that it's important not just to have your head know these things, but I want you to have a heart that is softened toward the truth of God's Word. You know what? Every week as I study for my lessons, I pray to God, God help me not just to have facts, but help me to have a soft heart. Help me to have a, a heart that's, that's loving the appearing of Jesus Christ. I hope you do too. So how can you be ready? Number one, you need to confess to God that you're a sinner. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The Bible says we're all sinners. We need to admit to God that we're short of a standard. And then we need to turn from the sin. Romans chapter one describing today says that, that men had pleasure in the sin. They knew it was against God, but they still had pleasure in it. Renounce that sin, admit you're a sinner. Number two, acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ had no sin. And when he went to the cross, he died, he shed his blood, he was buried, he rose again, and he did it in my place. He was my substitute, he was my redeemer. Just like a, a bride had to be redeemed, Jesus was our redeemer. He paid the full price to redeem us, to be his bride. And then the third thing is to say, yes, I've acknowledged I'm a sinner. Yes, I've acknowledged that Jesus is my savior, my substitute. And then third to say, I personally accept Jesus. I take him as my savior. The Bible indicates that when a person has Christ, then they have salvation. And then you'll have a blessed hope. You'll have all the hope that Christ will come back and take you home to heaven before this terrible time of the tribulation begins. Before other disasters come, you will have the hope that Jesus Christ is your savior. Would you join me and receive him today? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you, and again we thank you that you have a plan and you have a purpose. And Father, what an exciting time to live in because we have that blessed hope. And Father, I pray today as people see how near we are to the return of Christ, that they will make sure of their salvation. Father, I hope that there will be Christians who say, I'm a no-so Christian. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep me until that day. And Father, if there's one that's never received Christ, I pray that right now they might say, Lord Jesus, I take you as my personal Savior. I receive you. Thank you for paying the debt of my sin. Thank you for buying me, just like a Jewish man would buy a, a bride in Jesus' day. Jesus bought me for his own. Father, thank you for salvation. Thank you for the word of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.